So if I take a plus b plus c, I'll, I should get this. Uh, are the two masses? The two masses should be the same, correct? Two masses should be the same. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not the same. Let's say they aren't the same. Which one should you think more reliable? The right one. Why? The right one should be more reliable. If you weigh all three coins at once versus weighing them individually and summing up the masses, why? Not the condition is changing. There's another reason why. Each time you take a measurement, let's say this one came out 1.5389. 1.5389. Is that an exact number? No. What if the actual mass were this? You know, this means the actual mass um, might be from maybe, let's say it was 1.5388. Six, two, one, on and on. Let's say that was the actual mass. And so the actual mass is 1.5388621, etc. What do we we have to buy a more expensive balance? Because uh, we aren't getting the an accurate mass, are we? In fact, we're getting a rounded off mass, aren't we? And so each time we take a measurement, we introduce uncertainty, right? Every time you make a measurement, you introduce an error. There's an error associated with that measurement. And the error in this case is if the actual mass were 1.5388, our balance is incapable of registering that. And so what's the balance going to do? The balance has got to round that second eight up to a, a nine. And then it, uh, the same goes for B and C. So three measurements, three errors, which means we're going to have more relative error here than here. This is one measurement, one error. And so there's less uncertainty in this. And so the first part of the, the experiment is to look at that and see how well they agree. You know, and it's also a technique thing, because what if they're grossly mismatched? If these two are grossly mismatched, what do you call that? You call that experimental error? No, when you have a gross mismatch, you know, a severe experimental error, what you should do is you should repeat the measurement. Any time where you blow it, you should just repeat the measurement to get more reliable data. A lot of people blow, the, 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 not this, the mass isn't too, too difficult. The people who, who you know, the, there's still a lot of people, just a very few, that, you know, this will be grossly mismatched and they don't do anything about it. But that's, there's very few. Where the error comes in is um, in how, how to read this. You know, this is, uh, what's this called? Burette. Burettes, um, do you know how much this costs? I'm sorry? $120. If you break one, then they're going to bill you $120 for this. So try not to break it. Um, so the burette here, uh, we are going to um, just rinse out with some DI. You know, this is kind of hard to, to do here. So usually what people do is they get a beaker. And we have two types of water here, tap water this is called industrial water. It's industrial water because we don't have an anti-backflow valve here, so if somebody actually forces something back in here, it can contaminate it. So you don't want to drink this water in case somebody puts something here. And this water here, do you know what this water is called? This is not distilled water. This is deionized water. What's the difference between distilled water and deionized water? It, we use a different process to get rid of the ions in deionized. For the deionized water, it, there's no distillation. It passes through a column. Distillation is too expensive. You know, when I was at um, 
when I was a, uh, when I was doing research at UCLA, I would bring cart, a big cart with these big cubbies, you know, for storing ultra pure water. I had to use ultra pure water. To get the ultra pure water, I had to go to the psychology building. I don't know why they put it in the psychology building, but in the basement of the psychology building, they had our um, water apparatus, which was taking deionized water and doing a double distillation. So they distilled it once and then twice and then blast it with UV. Whenever you have ultra pure water, you don't use glass because glass contains ions. Some of those ions get leached into the water and you don't want that, especially sodium ions. And so we use these polyethylene jugs, it's gigantic, although that could potentially leach some stuff in there, but um, it was not significant. And so these big polyethylene jugs, we use that water. That water was very expensive. It was, cost a lot of money to, to distill. We don't have that kind of budget. We use deionizer. In, in fact, even the deionized is very expensive. We're, we're having trouble with deionized um, with our system because it, it's turning out to be quite costly do that and so try not to waste it but you know you use plenty of it because oops watch out because this comes out as a high pressure spray and it can splash up into you and if there's chemicals in here you don't want those chemicals to get in your eyes and so if you have goggles you know it's not a bad idea to wear them but goggles aren't necessary or required today I mean goggles aren't required you know they're necessary for protecting your eyes but anyway um, Depending on the last person to use this, you know, there could have been sodium hydroxide in here. Sodium hydroxide, if that splashes in your eyes, can cause a lot of damage. If you get sodium hydroxide on your fingers, do you know what your fingers feel like? Slippery, like soap. Bases are like that. And so if your fingers feel slippery, then there's got to be some sodium hydroxide residue. The last person to use this didn't clean it. And, you know, do you trust that it's cleaned? A lot of people say, oh, I got it from the stock room, the last person who used it must have cleaned it. But how do they clean it? Do they use tap water? Do they use deionized water? Or did they even bother cleaning it? Would you trust that? No, so obviously the first thing you do is to clean your glassware. Now to properly clean a burette, you should use soap and water to get rid of any residues. Right? Soap and water. But uh, to do a soap and water cleaning and then all the rinsing that's required takes too much time. So we aren't going to bother with the soap and water. We're just going to do a deionized rinse a few times. You can see if your burette is grossly contaminated because if there are water droplets adhering to the sides in a lot of different places, you know, then um, it's dirty. Because you know when you see little beads of water, those beads of water are due to something. Those beads of water are due to some kind of residue on the inside. Because water normally should not bead on glass. If we have good, clean glass, do you know what water should do? It should do something called wet the surface. Wetting the surface forms a very thin layer rather than bunching up into little droplets. And so if you see a lot of beading, then it's probably time to clean this thoroughly. If there's just minor amounts of beading, then it's okay. Most of it's wetting, you know, just a thin layer. You can see there. Water should be attracted to glass. Since water is attracted to the glass, it should smear, you know, or it should maximize the contact. In fact, that's what the meniscus is due to. Do you see in a meniscus, a water meniscus is always concave. And a water meniscus is always concave because the water wants to climb up the sides of the glass because it's attracted to the glass due to what we call ion. Glass has ions in there, some ions dipole attractions. Those electrical attractions pull the water up. In fact, if you have a very thin tube, you know, the electrical attractions are strong enough to overcome gravity and pull the glass up, I mean, not the glass up, pull the water up very high up the tube. That's called capillary action. That is due to intermolecular forces. Anyway, um, and so here, one of the things that people always forget to do is, um, Okay, we clean this out, we rinse it a, a few times, you know, like this. You let it drain out like this. But usually I just rotate it like this and wash off the walls and just dump it. So clean out the tip and the oops, side walls. Okay, that should be nice. Okay, then we fill the burette. We have little funnels so you don't spill it out like this. The little funnels in your drawer, 
I couldn't find mine. It's uh, making a mess. You should rinse out the funnel too. Okay, now is this beer up ready to go? No, you know what? A lot of people always forget that there's air inside the tip here, and we don't want any air inside the tip. And so we need to purge the tip. To purge the tip, this is what I recommend you do. You tilt it. You don't want to tilt it too much, otherwise it's going to spill out the end. But you tilt it like this. And we're going to force this air bubble out of the tip. Why do I want to tilt it like this? Because I don't have, you know, this is like, if you have a balloon and you try to push it under water, right, the deeper you go, the harder it is to push. And so the deeper, the, the deep, so look how deep underwater we are, and here's our little balloon that we're trying to get rid of. It's hard to push out, right? But if you're shallow, right on the surface, it's easy to push the balloon down because you don't have a huge, uh, what we call, weight or pressure. This is called water pressure. We don't have a lot of water pressure there. And so what I do is I tilt it to bring the balloon close to the surface here, and then it's easy to get rid of. Do you see that? It just went away. But you got to be careful because sometimes there's air trapped in the stopcock, which is the valve. I see a bubble. I see that bubble there. It's trapped there. And so what I'm going to do here is there's a tiny bubble trapped there from the stopcock. I just tap this like this. That gets rid of any kind of bubbles that are trapped there. And shut that. And now I'm down here. So I need to start at zero or below. Do you know it's actually considered poor technique to start at zero? Do you know why? A lot of people think it's proper technique to start at zero. So they get the dropper and then carefully drop it in until it hits zero. But it's considered poor technique because you're trying to bias your result, your observation. You know, and you get it close enough to zero, and you say it's close enough. We'll do that. Whereas if you just let it go wherever it goes, and I only need 10, I only need, I think, 20 milliliters here. And so it's okay. I'll start at 4. And this re reads from the top down, right? And so I read this. And I, you know what? I'm going to check all your, all your guys' readings. And so I need to check everybody's reading to make sure they're reading this correctly. Do you guys remember how to read this? Otherwise, I'll explain it now. Yeah? Remember? OK. Now we're ready to go. So I'll take my initial volume. And then I have my pre-weighed. Once this is weighed, you know, then I can handle it with my fingers. But I need to wipe off my fingerprints when I re-weigh it. Right? And then I have a burette clamp, a ring stand. I'm going to clamp this. A lot of people, when they clamp this, they don't know that it's at an angle. And then I just, oops, let's try not to break this one. Okay. But some people put it like this. It looks OK, right? But when I'm looking at them, because I look down this way, I see this. You know, is that OK? It's tilted. Do you see it's tilted? And it's not properly set in the grooves. Now, now it's okay. Now it's vertical. It should be vertical. When you read it, the meniscus should be below, above, or perpendicular to your eye level. Perpendicular. This leads to a systematic error. Some people always write, read it too, too low. The volumes are too low or the volumes are too high. You know, it's bad technique. And so we get our initial reading, and then uh, we got our pre-weighed Erlenmeyer watch glass, and then we're going to pour in. It says to pour in 20 milliliters. Am I going to try to get it at 20.00 milliliters? That's such a waste of time. Anywhere close to 20 is fine, as long as we get it to four sig figs, right? And so when, when this gets close to 20, let's say around 24, I'll stop. Because it started around four and a half. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say around. I should have that precisely measured. Right? Two decimal places. Does everybody know when they're reading scales, they have to guess between the lines? Right? And so each line here is a tenth of a milliliter, so we need to guess this to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter. And so now I got it close. Oh, okay, it's 34.48 milliliters here. 
And then I, my initial was 4.51 milliliters, subtract the two, I know what the volume is. So the procedure said to get 20, but I got more than 20, a little bit more, but no big deal. I'll just write it down. And then I'm going to do this to um, how many flasks? Three flasks. And so we're going to skip the mass and we're going to go straight to the burette. The burette part is to determine the density of water to as many sig figs as possible. And so. The density of water is going to depend on the temperature of the water. And so we need the temperature to x, x, point x degrees C. And so here we have to read between the lines. Our thermometers read to the nearest degree. And so we've got to estimate. This is called the estimated digit. And then we're going to have the volume initial from the burette. The volume initial is probably going to be x point xx milliliters. Again, we're going to have an estimated digit here. And the volume final is going to be xx point xx milliliters. And so we know what the volume is. And then, you know what we're going to do? We're going to weigh it. And so we got the, um, we got the mass of the flask plus watch glass that's going to be x x probably x x x point x x x x grams this digit the balance estimated it because this this is digits read off the balance read this off the balance but we call this the uncertain digit because there's a round off error that's introduced by the balance. All right? We don't know if that's an eight that was rounded to a nine or whatever. And then we're gonna have the mass of the flask plus watch glass plus water. X, X, X point X, 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 X grams. And then we can calculate the density. The density is going to be the mass of water. The mass of water, we're going to know to, um, it's 20 milliliters, so it's going to be about 20 grams. We're going to know this to six sig figs, divided by the volume of water. The volume of water, we're only going to know to how many sig figs. After the subtraction, we'll only, we'll only get four sig figs. And so we'll be able to calculate or experimentally determine the density to how many sig figs? Four sig figs. So we'll figure out the density of water to four sig figs. That's using the burette. Okay, the next part of this is um, using pipettes. This is what I want you to do here. We have two types of pipettes. We have, this is called a 25 milliliter TD pipette. This is called a Moore pipette. And this one can measure anywhere from zero to 10 like a burette. We always use DI water for our experiments. Tap water can contain um, solutes, which can change its density, of course. The first pipette you're going to use is this, the more pipette. Pipetting takes practice. And so what I want you to do is I want you to get plenty of practice to where you feel comfortable with the pipette. And so the first thing is the pipette bulb and the pipette and some water here. Okay, so you put the tip of the pipette in here, you squeeze the air out of the bulb, and then just gently put it on here and then let the water suck up. So the water's here, here. But before the water gets sucked into the bulb, you know, I need to remove the bulb so I don't suck water in here. 
just sort of remove it. And then put your finger on top or your thumb on top of this. A lot of people say don't put your thumb on here, but I, I use my thumb because, or the finger, uh, either is fine. But I just use my thumb because I got in the habit of that. Okay, now what I want to do is with this pipette, it's like a burette. This pipette, I'm, I have to stop on zero. Now I said it's considered poor technique to start the pipette, uh, excuse me, the burette at, at zero because you're biasing the result. Well, for this pipette, the more pipette, we must start at zero. Otherwise, I have no idea how much volume of water I'm putting in here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold this. Now, I don't want to submerge this in here because if I submerge it in here, it creates, you know, differences in water pressure. And those differences in water pressure means when I pull this out, it could suck in an air bubble. And so normally what you do is um, I put in too much water in there, is you place the tip of the pipette against some surface like this, and then you let it go down. And the thing is, a lot of people do this. When they pipette, they try to do this. You know, take their thumb off and put it back on quickly to control it. I never do that. You know, what I do is, um, well, this went down. If it, if it goes past the zero point, no big deal. Just start over again. You know, just put this back on here. Be careful not to suck any water in the bulb. This is what I do. Oh, bubble in there. This is what I do is I never lift my thumb off. The only thing is I hold it tight to stop it, and then I relax my thumb. If I relax my thumb, do you see how slow it's starting to move down? Just by relaxing. My thumb is always on there, but now it's relaxed rather than holding it up tightly. And so if I relax it, and I usually hold this, there's, I never lift it off. And then it goes slowly until it hits now I got to get the meniscus, the, the top of the meniscus or the bottom of the meniscus? The bottom of the meniscus right on the zero and then crunch it down. Whoops, I just lost a drop there. I didn't want to shake it. Don't shake it like this, otherwise you'll screw it up. Now it's below zero. So just start over. The, the thing is, the more practice you get, the easier this becomes, of course. And so the, the point of this is get some practice because we're going to do an experiment where pi if you screw up the pipetting, you're going to get bad results. This, this, you know what, I'm not going to deduct. Today's purpose is we're going to get some practice using the volumetric. And once you feel you've gotten practice, we're going to see how good you are by taking some measurements. Okay? And so here, just relax your thumb. My thumb's still sealed on there. You know, there's no air gap. And then, there, stop it. And now I can deliver that. Okay, I already put 20 mils in here. Should I dump it? You aren't going to dump this because I know how much this weighs. Right? Don't dump it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 10 mils to the 20 mils I already have in here, and that's going to give me about 30 mils. But I know, you know, I know precisely how much I have in each of these. And so when I, when I do this here, I... I now I'm going to take it off because I want it to go down fast. But when it gets close to 10, I need to stop. And so it's starting to approach 10, so I'm going to just gently rest my thumb on top of here and slow it down. And then when it hits 10, I stop it there. And so that should be 10.00 milliliters. 10.00. It's like a burette. What about this little bit of water in here? I did discard that because we don't know how much that is. And so every time somebody does this, they, they get 11 and a half milliliters. What did they do wrong? Every time they do this, they get 11 and a half milliliters. You know what they did wrong? They let all the water drain because the, this tip holds about one and a half milliliters. And so they end up with 11 and a half. And the densities are way up. I mean, not density, but the volumes are way off. And so with the more pipette, you know what we're doing? With the more pipette, we're calibrating the pipette. How do we calibrate the pipette? We measure out 10.00 according to the pipette, and then we weigh it to confirm it. But we need an accurate density. 
We could use the density that we just determined, which is the four sig figs, but we have an even better density. We have a density that's known to six sig figs. So we're going to use a six sig fig density to calculate from mass to volume and then see, do the volumes match? You know, I was supposed to get 10.00, did I? Well, it could be because the technique it didn't match or it could be because the pipette was miscalibrated. But when, whatever we're doing, we're figuring out what the volume is for this. Okay, We're going to do that how many times? We're going to do that three times. Okay, But this is after you practice. Okay, finally, we're going to use this pipe hat. And we're only going to do this one time. This pipe hat is 25 milliliter TD. TD stands for to deliver. This one needs two bulbs worth. Okay, be careful, the tip has always got to be submerged. If I lift the tip too high, then it sucks in air and causes a spray which can get sucked up into the bulb. And so the first bulb <clears throat> was only able to suck up this much, bulbs worth of vacuum. So I just remove the bulb, squeeze out the air, replace it, and then um, suck in the remaining. Be careful not to suck it out into the bulb. Oops, I was too slow there. And so let me try that again. To, to some tips that can help you. One, the tip is on the bottom of the beaker. It slows it down, the rate that it uh, flows out of here. Oops, did you see that? Now I sucked water into the bulb. Sucking water into the bulb is very bad because lots of people do that. And not just water, sodium hydroxide, HCl, a whole bunch of salt solutions. So the inside of these bulbs are grossly contaminated. And so what that means is now every time I do this, I'm contaminating whatever I have in here, unless I clean the inside of the bulb. But I'll tell you, nobody ever cleans the inside of the bulb. And sometimes what you see is you see yellow solution, you know, brown solution coming out of this bulb. It's not good. And so if I suck water into the bulb, I'll try to get it out, get rid of it as best as I can. Okay. Okay. And then um, let's do that. If I lift the tip up, look how much faster it goes. If I put the tip down, look how slow. Tip up. Oh, actually, errors. So tip down, tip up. So I'll put the tip down to slow it down. Oops. And then there's a mark. Everybody's mark is going to be a little different. And so it doesn't matter what finger you use. I just like to use my thumb because it's in a more relaxed position, and then I hold it like this. I always hold the pipette like this. But if you use this finger, you do the same thing. You never lift the finger off. You just hold it tight or relaxed, and that'll, that'll do the same thing. But in this one, you get it. You start it right on the mark, and then you deliver it. So I deliver it here. OK, and then I, I have the tip here to catch any bubbles, I mean uh, drops there. But when I look at the tip, it looks like there are two or three drops stuck in the tip. Those two or three drops, should I just spray those into here? Just force those two, because those two or three drops seem to be stuck in there. They aren't coming out. And so should I just um, use a little bit of air pressure? And then here, let's see how many drops there were. Oh, maybe just one, one and a half drops or something. Should I just spray those out using a little bit of air pressure from the bulb? Yes or no? No. Why? Yeah. Because it's calibrated to compensate. This is a TD pipe hat. And so it's, it's calibrated to deliver. And to deliver means there could be some remaining drops in here. Versus a TC pipe hat. A TC pipe hat means to contain. If you have a TC pipe hat, then it's designed to contain that amount, not to deliver. And so if it's designed to contain, you've got to make sure you squirt everything out. All our pipe hats are TD pets to deliver. Okay, any questions on that? So we're only going to do three parts. We're going to do the beer rad, experimental determination of the density of water. 
We're going to do the 10 milliliter more pipette, which is calibration of the pipette using a known density of water. Three times for the burette, three trials for the pipette, and then we're going to use the 25 milliliter volumetric one trial for this. We aren't going to dump out the water. We're just going to leave the water and just pour it in because we already know what the mass is. So we don't have to re-tear it or do anything. Okay. You'll have to tear. The, you'll have to zero the balance before you put that on, of course, to weigh the whole thing. Okay. Any questions? All right. All right. Uh, you could. You could work individually or. or Actually, everybody's going to do individually, too, with the pipettes, but you're going to have to check out some equipment. Go check out the equipment from the stock room, and um, you'll need some uh, pipettes and I don't know what else. They, they'll have it. So just go over to the stock room and check that out. Uh-huh. If, if you're not registered... Um, You could work with somebody who is who has a drawer if you want. Let's see, yeah. It's looking like I have too many people and not enough drawers uh, right now. So I'll have to see how we can, we can do them. Yeah, I can't give you the drawer because um, you could share it though. I have um, three people absent or something today. I'll see what happened to them tomorrow. You know, if there's some excuse or not for that, I'll figure out what to do. I don't know what the worst comes to worst. Mm -hmm. I don't mind sharing the drawer. We we can't have. I mean, the, that's the problem. Is a lot of the experiments are individual. I'm not saying to, to mm -hmm. share the things, to do the experiment mm -hmm. together. I'm just saying to share the glassware so we don't... Yeah, uh, we can only... Because um, basically there are only a certain number of stations. According to like a code, everybody has to have a certain number of feet of, of, of workspace. And so, you know, I, there's only a certain limit that I can do up to. How many spaces mm -hmm. do you have anyway? Yeah, let me. Well, I got to see what happened to some no shows. I have. I know one person's in the hospital, so I can't drop them. Um, they're planning to come, but um, they're supposed to come this week, so we'll see if they show up or not, um, or if they, they're going to decide to drop. And then I have some other people who didn't show up. So. So this can be up like thirty-six spots because each seems like each side is six people. Yeah, so roughly, roughly. Yeah. So we'll see. You, you know, you've done this one, right? The whole one. You don't have to do it again. All right. Yeah, then do it. Do it. Well, I, this this one's a little different than the last time it's I did little, this. Because uh, this time, uh, it's just mainly practice, you know. Practice a little bit. Okay. The okay of crystals. Okay. Okay. All right. Just yeah. Then do this one. Work with somebody if they you know, or something. Or you could work over here too. There's one drawer there. Why don't you guys all work together? If you want? Uh, you guys who are still trying to add, you can work over here, along um, out of out of one drawer and just work it with partners and share. Oops.